Now, coming out of COVID, supposedly, everyone's a little bit rough. People are kind of putting Humpty back together again and trying to find modalities to help do that. And they're drawing to the Eastern modalities that aren't exclusive to the East, that here in the West, that we're starting to, to really take shape and really develop. One thing uh, that you can see around on the internet, especially on TikTok and over there on Instagram and all over the internet, is a wonderful lady in Melbourne doing some wonderful things. And not to shortchange it through social media, some deep healings are happening on that table. You might have seen them, some some moving and shaking, some more like breakdancing and twerking happening on those tables. <laughs> and the lady responsible for that, they call her the doctor. Dr. Sarah, how are you this afternoon? Oh, Nick, look, I've never been described as someone who's also a choreographer. Um, so the fact that I'm creating these breakdancing moves on the table, um, but I'm glad that you did touch on the actual fact of some, you know, deep um, consciousness and energy healing occurring on the tables as well. Um, I'm glad to be here having a chat with you today. Yeah, yeah, look, it's a pleasure to have you. I know you're a, you're a, you're a woman that's around, but I tell you what, you're not the stereotype. I mean, without being judgmental you might associate with such type with wearing kind of ragged clothes and, and hairy armpits and incense everywhere there's a place for all that there's a place for all that not judging but yourself you're very into your fashion and you're into your you're not the stereotype what i'm trying to say is and you've got some art behind you you know yeah. let's 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 crack you open a little bit here where did where did these all this start for yourself and how did you identify that the world needed this modality that you've created yeah, look, I think I've always been a little bit of a juxtaposition myself, which is what this uh, modality technically is as well. It's a blend of both the East and the West and, you know, the expected and the unexpected. And I think that's just been a reflection of what my experience has mm. been as a human being on this planet. You know, you're right, it doesn't necessarily fit the stereotypical um, notion of either being a chiropractor or having a background in science or psychology um, or even necessarily the Eastern components of my work, which is the Buddhist influence as well. And Ooh. so I quite enjoy that, though. I enjoy making people question what they think things are supposed to be like. I like the fact that it looks, um, you know, almost strange and, you know, extraordinary because if you want to have a life that is extraordinary, you have to start tapping into the places that create that. And this work is definitely something along those lines. But to cut it short, I actually was in fashion for a while. Um, so as much as I, you know, do have this depth and this understanding of wanting to know myself and the world on a deeper level, I also uh, understand that I do live in this 3D human experience and anything where I can express a, a version of myself or a creation of self, um, I like to tap into it. So I come from a fashion artistic um, background uh, and then moved into psychology loved psychology but found it was a little bit too diagnostic for me it wasn't contextual enough or even functional enough for the westerner for the human being um, in terms of looking at them as a whole picture rather than looking at them as something that is broken or, or that needs to be fixed so I, I then moved into psychotherapy and more transpersonal kind of uh, style um, of psychology then went on on ND Cairo um, for applied science clinical science but not Cairo like you expect there's no manipulation when you see me working with people there is legitimately pretty much no touch or if any touch it's very light and gentle or majority of the time actually in the energetic field and as further away from the body as possible and then I did my master's and postgraduate um, in Buddhism and currently finishing my master's in Chinese medicine so wow. you know I've had it you know it was important for me to fit the criteria of qualifications in the west um, to bring it to the west and these are, you know, Eastern flavors and existing things that have occurred over many, many centuries, whether it's TCM or Ayurvedic medicine or, um, you know, Chi, Prana, all these concepts throughout mm. the East and, and bring it to the West in a way that's, um, you know, applicable for us as everyday people here, even in Australia. Jeez, your signature block must be massive with all your uh, accreditations. <laughs> email it does go for quite a while um but you know in stating that it's the attachment the whole attachment is just your credentials <laughs> it is and i know like obviously there's a part of me that understands that that is meaningless um but there's also a part of me that also recognizes that it does give some form of legitimacy to this strange yeah. thing that we call spinal energetics which is the modality that we've created and i wanted to bring a little bit more of um 
piece for those who speak a little bit more or think a little bit more rationally from the mind or logically uh, to bring some kind of, uh, I guess, weight and legitimacy to the way that they're, they're processing here in the world and then give them the access to what really matters, which is far more outside of that spectrum. Wow. And correction. I'll correct you now. You weren't in fashion. You still are in fashion. <laughs> Look, fashion is an extension of self. Mm. So, you know, you can put it in a box and say it's just this, but it's really not. You know, people get an understanding of who I am who I am, and maybe even my values, my beliefs and my understandings of the world based upon a reflection of what I wear and how I choose to, to wear it. So fashion is an expression of self, and I think um, there's far more meaning to it than, than I guess, what an everyday person may, may attach to it. Uh, but I just love the fact that you can have a reflection of your inner world and and bring that into existence into the external and the outer um and i think it gives permission to people to explore those parts of themselves too i know it's great because when you're kind of on the path and you love your self-development or the spiritual work whatever you want to label it and you spend a lot of time inside the garage there no pun intended (laughs) and then you can kind of you can kind of get a little bit you can kind of get a little bit sick of yourself because you're just on and you're just constantly processing and energies and mm-hmm. you're processing, you're processing, and you have like little crises and it's just, you can become so internal and then you yeah. find, then you kind of start to really celebrate your external world and then you, you the fashions yeah. and all that kind of cool stuff and mm-hmm. it's a great little balance between the inside and the outside world. And speaking of yeah. the world and inside and outside, the role of traumatic patterns, you know, we, mm. Sarah, we didn't hear the word trauma for a while. We didn't hear it in the 90s. We didn't hear it in the early thousands. We're no. hearing these huge things now like trauma and, you know, other things too, like narcissism and that kind of stuff. It's great that it's yeah. kind of been out there now so we can start to tackle this stuff and clear it. But trauma yeah. now, we, we, we associated trauma with war veterans, PTSD and whatnot. Now it's yeah. becoming so more in the mainstream. And I think it's a great mm-hmm. thing because we've all got it, especially childhood stuff. And uh, if you're like me, you grew up, uh, you, know, you know, as a wog and it wasn't very easy being greasy. <laughs> me too. I totally understand. You're not you know? European unless you've been traumatised. Well, <laughs> my dad's first car was a donkey, you know what I mean? And they've come from the village. So imagine coming to Australia and then having to deal with that and, you know, growing up, you know, in like Australia, oh, yeah. it, was, it was different. But it was challenging and great. But we've got like a whole... To put those two big statements together, almost like, you know, my parents are Eastern European, you know, of the Macedonian heritage, which is the Balkan mm-hmm. Sea, and a huge, huge, huge ancestral traumatic line of narcissism, right? Yeah, and you kind yeah. of, that's all on the clothesline, and you kind of like given that when you're, when you're, when you're born, and you kind of got to, you got to work through that stuff if you're conscious. Mm-hmm. You can either push it and project it elsewhere, or you can, you can either go outward or you can go inward. And the ones that yeah. go inward are usually kind of empathic and a bit more on the sensitive side of uh, of the gate, meaning they need to do the work. And it's great in 2023 that people like yourself are putting it out there. How do you think, how important is it now to really clear this? And, and what do you see in the general public of how trauma yeah. influences society without using the word politicians? <laughs> I love that added added um, complexity there at the end. Look, trauma, if you don't necessarily like that word, it is a loaded word and it is kind of a, a hot term at the moment, um, mm. just like narcissism is. So if you want to remove the word trauma and look at it more so, what has occurred in your life that's been outside of your level or window of tolerance as a human being? What has had an impact on you that was hard for you to integrate and therefore you weren't able to integrate it and therefore it's stored in your system? That's a way to look at it if, you, if you're feeling like trauma is this kind of, you know, just this notion that we've jumped onto. Yes, there's trauma in the understanding of PTSD, veterans wars, all that kind of thing. But majority of the time these days when they're talking about trauma, that's what they're specifically talking about. Things that have occurred in your life that have just been challenging for you to actually consolidate. And therefore, where, where does it go if you're not consolidating it and transforming it? Well, it becomes it becomes a part of your system. So whatever emotion occurs in your system is reflected through the system and through the spine itself which is why we work with the spine predominantly. But it's also really important to remember that we are malleable. We have, you know, the ability of neuroplasticity occurring within us. So just because something has occurred in our life doesn't mean that we are stuck that way. It is not a life sentence, mm. you know. There's so much um, that we can do to change and impact um, ourselves in relation to the traumatic uh, events that have occurred as individuals. And again, in terms of narcissism, we all have components of uh, narcissistic tendencies, mm. okay? And that's not to say that there aren't true narcissists out there. There are, but again, I 
I prefer to kind of work from that space of what connects us all rather than what separates us, what yeah. connects us, what part of us is within that person that's within me too, that we therefore can go on this, you know, journey together to become more connected than ever because the problems in our society and, and in our communities are because we are less connected to each other, you know. So even though in this, you know, field in terms of uh, – you know, self-development and you do need to turn a little weird for a moment there. You do need to go internal. You do need mm. to have these situations where maybe you're different to those around you and, and you're having these transformations. But ideally, we're not meant to be alone in this world. We're meant to find others that we can connect to. So the longer we separate and put people outside of ourselves or that there's something with them that's not within us, the less likely we are to actually connect as individuals on that deeper level and on from that non-egoic kind of state as well. Yeah, and the ego's a word that's tossed around a lot too. And, yeah. Um, but, but you can't be scared of it, I think, because the thing is, yeah. and you mentioned narcissism, like we've all got that. Narcissism has become such a deadly word, but I mean, we've all got that little that little thing in us. And, you know, Dave Navarro, the great Dave Navarro guitar player. Dave for Navarro. James I Dave Navarro. Don't, I know who he is. He's a legend. He's my favorite guitar player of all time. He's um, a lot of people's favorite guitar he, players. Go a, to the Red Hot Chili Peppers for a little bit as well. Oh, the Peppers. Don't start me about the Peppers. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pepperhead from way back. Um, so basically, Navarro said, as a, as a, as basically as an entertainer, he says, if you're a musician or an actor or a stage guy, there's a certain element of you that wants to be liked and, and be watched, you know? There's a certain part of you in all of us, you know, you can't deny that. There's a certain part of us that wants to get on stage and be cheered, you know? And I think that's true. And, and instead of trying to wipe all that away, you kind of you, you need to use that. Henry Rollins is the same, of course, uh, mm-hmm. growing through. He, someone asked him, why do you don't do music anymore and you just kind of tour the world doing your spoken word? And he goes, well, I didn't get enough love from my dad. Um, I'm out there oh, getting wow. approval every night and I decided that it wasn't so bad and I'm creating great work from it. And, mm. you know, and you that's... Use it as power. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the ego can be utilised in a way as long as you have the awareness of what it is and you and when you are aware, you can utilise it as a tool to propel you. You know, I need a little bit of ego to create, you know, this idea of wanting everyone in the world to experience this work. Mm. It's not a negative thing as such. It is something that can be used as fuel within you uh, and fuel is energy to then create something outside and bigger than yourself. And you need the ego to survive in this world. If you didn't have it, you know, what would you be? And even those of us, you know, who are monks, who are up in the Himalayas, they have egos too. The yeah. difference is is how they interact with their ego. It's not completely dissolved. Although Eckhart Tolle is someone who claims that his ego is, is completely dissolved. Um, and he might be right. I, that's not something I can comment on in that regard. But the majority of us who are residing here on Earth, we are left with our egos. But what can we do to make it be um, advantageous to us or give us the opportunity to live a more optimal life rather than one that's a dysregulated or painful life? Yeah, I think Ed Cart's probably the one exception. He must he he comes across totally egoless, like this he actually blank is, canvas. Yeah, where he's yeah, just pushing yeah. through. But you know, I think without the ego, you're just totally blank. And the great thing about Ed Cart is he's probably so pure, and he is probably dissolved. Where we're all trying to attain maybe what he what he kind of you know presents, but we'll, ne- we'll never it. get there. Moments we'll never get there, it. but we don't need to. You know. <laughs> No, it's having the moments of it. And, you know, and even in the West, when people look at my modality, it's very challenging for them because they don't understand these concepts of energy and like that Mm. even existence in itself is energy. And um, the movement of energy comes in so many shapes, so many forms. And that's what we see when we look at people expressing on the table these tension patterns and releasing them themselves. It's so outside of what we've been conditioned and taught in the West. However, in the East, we were just, you know, on Indonesian television, on the Today Show, it's part of the their culture to wow. understand that that value of the esoteric so that's something that we really are trying to bring back to the west and having um this understanding and becoming aware of our, our energy our vitality and how in our day-to-day lives here or in the ordinary day-to-day life how we can actually fill it with more wonder and mystery and um through the subtlest expression of human energy which is what we're doing with spinal energetics oh that's wonderful you mentioned indonesia like going to bali they just they are wonderful over there they work with the they spirits they work with the gods they pray three times a day there's spirits and gods just walking around everywhere whether they're dark and negative but they're all there and they totally mm-hmm. get it. Yeah, I have a mentor 
who uh, is definitely who who's huge on Chinese medicine, who created uh, the twenty four hour chi cycle. Who yes, is yes, taking yes. us to Bali? You might have heard of him. You know Yost. I've Sal? heard of him. You know I have Yost? heard of him. Yeah, I Yost. I don't know him personally, but I've heard of He's him. He's my guy. I've, I've had him for about twenty years on my in my corner, and um, done some uh, retreats for the tree cycle in Bali two years in a row. And it was just mm. we went in the middle of nowhere, out in the sticks, right? You know where that volcano is in Bali? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. We yeah, were there yeah, yeah. at Yasri for two, uh, over two years. Incredible. Two different. Oh, I tell you what, instant manifestations, little bits of. Um, Little uh, temples everywhere, and in the morning mm. I used to wake up and do my Tai Chi, my practice at the temple, and I just felt so supported by presences around me that were correcting mm-hmm. me, and it was just insane. So such a such a heavy place. So, eh? but that connection is the community as well. So when I say community, I don't just mean to others around us, like other human beings. We need connection to something larger than ourselves to feel alive mm. as well. You know, I use the term consciousness, whatever term you want to utilize, but what you were experiencing in that moment is a connection to the peace and of, of what's larger than yourself. Once you feel that, once you get this knowing of this complete being within you, you 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 can't unfeel it. You can't unhear it. You can't unsee it. And that's the exact same thing that we're working with in terms of the energetic work that we're doing with spinal. We're allowing people to connect to that part that is them, but also the entirety. Mm. And then once you feel that, it's just this utter sense of peace. Wow. Utter sense of peace. And then therefore from that, then you understand a little bit more um, in terms of your, you know, individuality and your existence and how you can evolve and, and what that looks like for you. And um, that's where kind of the divinity and the beauty of it really is. That's amazing. And, and these kinds of things that you mentioned when it comes to energy and these modalities, words can't really do it justice because it's all an experience and you need to feel it. But yeah. if you had to kind of give a description, for say for a listener that hasn't, that's trying to grasp the concept, what would you say? What's happening during a session? Uh, yeah, look, it, it is very hard to put kind of in an mm. objective scientific way because it, it is mysterious. Um, and it's something that I guess you could say is miraculous and therefore you have to experience it to understand it rather than explain it with words, with logic. Mm. It's beyond words. It's beyond logic. You have to almost um, become one with it (laughs) to understand it. But if I'm to to explain it in the most layman's terms that I can, basically your your spine, even when you think about an emotion you've experienced, whether you're angry, the way that you shape yourself is in your spine and in your posture is different, yeah? Mm. So that's how connected to the emotion and your experiences, your spine and your nervous system are. What also happens as a result of things you experience as a human being in this world is tension patterns start occurring within the spine. Those tension patterns might be there for mentality reasons, emotional reasons, spiritual reasons, dharma or karma reasons, Mm. all right? But the idea is that there's a tension pattern in the system that's creating, I guess, for lack of better word, um, less freedom and less balance in the body. So what we do is we then find the areas of where this tension is, but we find the area that's opening, the area that's welcoming, the area that wants to be connected within the disconnected. And we do that through the energetic field. And by doing that, we connect to that, that, that moment. We call it almost uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Brett Jones, he calls it a Kairos moment where it's almost an intervention between consciousness and what is and in that moment the body has the ability through this light touch to feel calm to feel restful and therefore unwind the tension on its own so traditionally within uh, even chiropractic what we're doing is we believe that there's a tension pattern and we therefore manipulate the vertebra in a way um, to bring in more alignment but that's still an external force What we're doing is even with the lightest touch, allowing the body to connect to itself, find the tension pattern and that same inner physician, that same inner wisdom that exists within all of us, that same thing that digests your food, the same thing, you know, that um, makes a flower grow, the same thing that keeps your heart beating, that that's what's created that pattern that then unwinds it. So you're looking at it from a completely different viewpoint. The body's intelligence is unwinding because it realizes it no longer needs to hold it as opposed to an external force coming in and attempting to change what what the body's intelligence is. And you just Uh can't. You can't override that. You've got to work with the body's intelligence, create safety for it, create connection to it, create ease for it. So therefore, that can integrate it, transform it, and therefore, you transform your life as a result. That's the most sense anyone's made in 2023. 
what you just said. Did you there. like that? Yeah, well, that makes the, sense. Well, just the fact that you walk around and everyone's like, we're going to change this, you're going to change this, you're going to turn your back on this, this is wrong, this is wrong, change this, this is bad, this is change, change, change. Yeah, change, but don't work against it, work with the body. Work with it. Work because with the, the body. body's doing it for a reason. The body will never mm. create something out of context, ever. Yeah. The body is the most intelligent, you know, it, it, it's a system that we can't understand. You know, I was so blessed in university to work with cadavers and to see the intricacy of what we are. And that's just at the physical plane to actually understand the energetic component and what's actually going on physiologically and, and the brain and all of that part. We as a human being could never know it all. We can't understand that wisdom. What we do is we honor the wisdom mm. by connecting to it, creating creating safety and ease with that connection, allowing the body to welcome us in. And therefore that same physician, the inner physician that's in all of us, right? So whether women who get their periods every 28 days, uh, when we eat our food and we know that we go to the toilet afterwards, mm. all of that stuff is automatic functions that we take for granted that is wisdom. Yeah. That is energy. That energy is wisdom. By connecting to that, we're therefore then creating the most opportunity for the body to find homeostasis, balance, all those things that it just needs to create on its own without this tension being there from whatever you've experienced in your life rather than this, or this thing of trying to fix it, this thing of that shouldn't be there, this thing yeah. of forcing. Let's work with it rather than trying to change through force. It never works. And it's the same thing, you know, in life. You can't force a horse to drink, you know. You can't do it. You've got to allow the horse to feel safe enough to want to drink. Uh, 100%. And it's the same thing with us. 100%. You mentioned the body just always seeking homeostasis, and it is. And the fact is, stuff like what you're doing, that just accelerates that, doesn't it? That's Look, that's the that's the Desired effect. <laughs> that's the desired effect. Is connect, the desired effect is connect you to who you really are, not what you've experienced. Who are you meant to be, not what your past has decided you are supposed to be and your nervous system is reacting. Who are you without the reaction? Wow. That's who we're trying to connect you to. And by connecting to that, by connecting to a state of ease and joy and happiness and relief on the table, you're therefore going to reflect that in your life. You can't have that state on the table and therefore not start accessing it as you live and experience through this world. So that's the goal of it. Well, you just took the words out of my mouth there. You've definitely... Uh... Perfect segue. My next question was processing such traumatic energy, if you will, but then integrating it back into your real world because something when you're sitting on your on your on the table there and then all of a sudden you're gonna go back into your nine to five or go back and mow the lawn and wash the dishes. You yeah. can uh, you know, you wanna integrate it and not get thrown back into that. I know you've probably processed some stuff and you feel a little lighter, even physically. How mm -hmm. does one integrate such work? Yeah, look, so the way that we do the sessions is work in a way that we understand the functionality of the Westerner, okay? Mm. So we understand that you might have a 40 to 60 hour work week. We understand that you might have four children at home. We understand that. So what we do is we work layer by layer with the person on the table to the level of their ability to integrate it. Now, that doesn't mean that it's the only layer available for us to unwind. There are usually quite a few um, processes and layers that show up in the system, but the amount to which that we work with is based upon the ability of that person to function in the 3D world still. Because wow. at the end of the day, we are here. We want to be able to pay our bills. We want to be able to make sure our kids are fed and safe, whatever it might be, turn up to work. And we can't necessarily do that while integrating large amounts and processing large amounts at the same time. So yeah. we might do it piece by piece, but it is a very individualized process. So what, what you can actually tolerate and what you can actually transform energetically might be different to say someone else. So we work within your ability as an individual, your unique experience. And, and that's where the sessions and the timing of them and how frequent of them are based upon. Um, but we always keep in mind that this is for the consumer of Australia, of America, of the West. We're trying to bring this Eastern, um, you know, gold to the West, almost like how yoga came from India, mm. um, and bring it in a way which is accessible for us and of most benefit for us in a way that, you know, is also relatable, but also um, functional for us as, as the way that we live here. You've definitely spread the message and just looking at your website and your social media, you, a lot of people around the world, not just here in Australia, are learning this practice and are starting to, you've developed all these warriors now out there doing this. <laughs> yeah, we 
we've got over 400 um, practitioners wow. now under a year. Yeah, and we're, wow. we're very meticulous. That's about more than a new one a day. <laughs> yeah, and we're very meticulous about who gets into the course as well. So there's a lot of people who apply who don't actually get into the course. And the reason we're particular is that the integrity of it mm. is something that's hugely important to me. Um, so, you know, we're getting, we've just uh, qualified our first Kenyan practitioner. We've got people in Dubai. We've got people in Singapore. We've got people in Indonesia. We've got people in LA, New York, Philadelphia. We've got people in New Zealand. We've got people wow. in France. We've got people in the UK, Canada. We've got people who are actually getting funded to come over here from, you know, native, um, you know, indigenous uh, reservations because they've noticed the change in what they bring back to their communities there. So this is happening from, you know, from all different cultures and all different ages and all different, um, you know, beliefs and value systems because it's not necessarily a cultural thing, it's a human thing. Yeah. And so once we all connect to what humanness is, it doesn't matter whether you're from the East or the West, it, you can connect to this work and that's really what it's about. I want everyone to be able to experience it because once I couldn't live without it and, and that's from my own experience and my own uh, trauma, so to speak, and my own yeah. understanding of life. And it's just been of such benefit to me of understanding of what, what it means to work with energy, the, the fascia and, and what stores in the tissues and, and what that is and, and how that then reflects in my life, though, emotionally and externally in terms of how I respond. Like, how do I react to my family now when they say something that irritates me compared to how I reacted 10 years ago yeah. now that I've integrated it and I'm more free and have less tension in my body? It's a very different response and it's an actual response chosen from my awareness. Now, that's not to say it's always like that. There are things that I still need to work on as a human being as well and that's part of the human evolution mm -hmm. and that's also why this work becomes a lifetime work because you're never going to be you know, perfect. And even if we sorted out every pattern within you that day, you're going to go out next week and who knows what might occur and what else might need to be, you know, um, awakened within you or transformed within you. So it becomes part of your your life, like meditation might or like yoga might for, for those who at least understand those practices. How does one integrate that, though, with a steady life to continue doing their practices? A lot of people and get kind of really lost and get caught up. It's like, whoa, you've gone too far. I'll bring it back a little love. Yeah. Um, well, you have the support. You have the support from the practitioner. So you've got a yeah. guide, basically. Um, you've got someone guiding you the whole way. And that's what's also important. You know, if I'm going to go for a, a trek in the desert, I want to have someone who's been to the desert before helping me. Mm. And, and that's kind of what the practi practitioner is. It's not that we have something within us. We're not doing anything to you. We don't know more than you. But what we do have is the ability to hold space with you while you're on this journey. And look, it's not an easy thing. Sometimes it will create uh, things for you to look at that you've not wanted to look at. Another thing is it actually makes your internal voice louder. So that yeah. voice that you've been trying to ignore, if it's telling you to leave that relationship or leave that job or this isn't for you, guess what happens when you start doing spinal? It becomes louder. The voice mm -hmm. of yourself, your true self, your soul becomes louder. Now, that's not necessarily a comfortable thing because guess what you have to do then? Change. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't want to change. So this is the work for the faint-hearted as such, but it is work for those who are courageous enough to live the life that they were meant to live. Absolutely. Um, and that old saying, that old Rolling Stones song, you don't get what you want, you get what you need. <laughs> and when you, you, know, you go down such a path, it's always there and it's clear as day. And you, hit, you said that voice and um, stuff that's stored in the body, it's there for a reason because you avoided it for all this time. And it's well, stuff it that's go? not pleasant. Where do you think it's gone? If in you your body. If, exactly. So that's what people have to understand as well. If you're saving it for later, if you're wanting to deal with that later, that later is in your physicality. And but, so that's something to look at as well. But hearing this is so refreshing, Sarah, because basically with these, again, the different modalities, and there's so much out there, some really good stuff out there, people do it straight off the street. And then after two weeks, they've, they feel like shite, you know, they don't, they don't feel good. They feel like crap. I was like, oh, I don't feel good anymore. I wanted to come here to feel good and I'm feeling the, the opposite. Yeah, and it's yeah, like, yeah. no, 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 don't go though. anywhere. You're, you're actually getting somewhere. You're processing your rubbish. You're, you're clearing, precipice. you're clearing you're the crap. You're precipice when you're, that happens. Exactly. You're so clearing all the crap. That. We welcome that. Oh, we that's all it's all we about. welcome that feeling because we are confused here in the West that if something's good for us, it must therefore be gratifying to us. Mm. Another Guess quote what? of the year. The things that are gratifying to you instantly are the things that are causing you the most harm as a human. 
Yes. So let go of that need for that instant gratification. That's not what this work is about. This work will, if you've stored things within you that have made you angry, resentful, frustrated, why on earth would that be gratifying as you're unwinding it? It won't be. Nah. And that's not to say there are times of bliss on the table. There are. There, there are moments of transcendence and there are aspects to that. But our goal isn't to always reach that part. We have people who just want to go, you know, to the, to the transcendent state. No, no. You need to work through that mud first mm. a lot of the time. And that means sitting in the discomfort. But the difference is you couldn't sit in the discomfort when the, when the event occurred, but this time you have the guidance and the assistance and the support of the practitioner around you, plus the safety being related to your nervous system to unwind on its own, and therefore that's what the change is. But this isn't work for people who want to be comfortable and um, feel good all the time. It's actually just not possible and you're chasing the wrong thing. Oh, 100%. And it's kind of like a, I know a lot of guys, uh, a lot of friends that do that do ayahuasca ceremonies. I haven't been mm-hmm. down that path as yet if I ever get there. But they always talk yeah. about some people want to go to, you know, experience it and just get the blissful lovey-dovey hearty stuff. But then mm-hmm. you might have get a rude surprise if you get like a darker, <laughs> a darker experience. But that's all yeah. about not applying analysis to this stuff, isn't it? It's just sitting in polarity right in the middle and you get what you need, like I quoted the Rolling Stone song before. Mm-hmm. A hundred percent. And again, what you need and what you want are usually very different. Yeah. And and if you think about life itself, just imagine if you got everything you had always wanted. That's be, not what it's. You know, it'd be boring. Life. It'd be boring. Life. Life. Life is, to some degree, predestined. There's there's kismet. There's karmic patterns. There's dharma. There's all sorts of things that are all intertwined to work in a way where you are where you are supposed to be to learn the lessons that you were supposed to learn. And that does not mean comfort. And that does not mean happiness all the time. Here in the West, again, we're very confused. We think that we're supposed to be happy all the time. Happiness is the, is the real belief of life is not to be happy. There's glimpses of happiness and, and understanding the privilege of what it is when you experience it. But you can't live your life hoping to be happy the whole time because that, you're, you're setting yourself up for complete and utter suffering, which is why Buddhism and Hinduism were you know, these philosophies that really sat with me as an individual because I could understand that as someone. I couldn't understand this thing where you just have to go through life and, and have this positive outlook all the time because life is not always positive. And, and that's okay, but you've got to be able to mix between the dualities, the polarities, and, and have that ability to go between the two. And when you have a, a regulated nervous system and a nervous system that's free of tension and, and free to be who you are, that dance is a whole lot easier and a whole lot more enjoyable and you get to actually interact with life rather than just purely react to the wave that's coming to you. Well, you're free. And if you're out there seeking joy and happiness, you're not free because you're still tied to chase, you know, to state chasing. And I think Yogananda said it perfectly. Yeah. He wrote uh, the Organ of Boraga for the Yogi, of course, the Bible for the, for the spiritual underworld. And early in the yeah. piece they spoke about, the dad said, well, it's about, le- you know, it's about, level-mindedness, not uh, cashing in the wins and not falling too low on the lows. It's just sitting in the middle and it is what it is and just freeing yourself. Yeah, and not labelling things as good or bad. You know, there's that beautiful, Mm. um, you know, folk story about, um, you know, a a man's son fell off the horse and broke his leg and everyone in the village came and said, oh, that's so terrible, it's so bad. And he said, is it? And then what happened is all the young men who were fit and healthy were called to war and his son did not have to go. So these ideas of what good or bad are, just try to resist labelling things as that because you actually don't understand the outcome or the effect of that till a lot further down the track. And um, Steve Jobs actually gave that book out at his funeral for everyone who attended because that's how yeah, that's how important it was to his life yeah. um, and his belief systems. He wanted everyone to read it. So it was a gift that he gave to everyone at his funeral. It's very, and everyone should read that book. It's, it's the Bible um, for understanding, you know, I guess <laughs> yourself more, but also mm. your patterns more and, and your mind more because a lot of us are run by our minds here. The oh, mind yeah. runs us. Rather than 100%. us interacting with the mentality, the mentality is completely um, in charge of us. And that's also why there is so much pain. Oh, I tell you what, and I do learn a lot of different kinds of internal arts here, like your qigongs and your tai chi yeah. and stuff. And the teacher yeah. will always say, okay, in the morning, 
Don't listen to your mind. Your mind's going to say this. You got to you got to just do it, and um, that's what it's all about. Your mind's the computer, though. It's not meant to be making these decisions for you. No, the mind will tell you every day not to do your qigong. Mm. It will. It will say, "I don't want to do this now." You've got to learn to almost train it like an animal, so to speak. Of course. You've got to learn to be in charge of it in the in the sense of um, just making sure that, that you use it to your ability rather than the mind being in charge of you. And a lot of us are very driven by what, what thoughts we have. We believe every thought that we yeah. have. We attach to every thought that we have without the true understanding of what that process is and how fleeting it is and how quickly it is changing. Um, if you just watch your thoughts throughout the day, even your emotional response to say something, sit with it for another two hours, the way you're responding and the way that you've, you've perceived it changes. And that, again, is, is it. It's purely just a perception. It's not necessarily reality either. So you've got to be willing to to um, sit with yourself. And that's something that I think is a struggle for many of us. Um, and also why COVID was so challenging too, because mm. people were forced for the first time in their life to sit with themselves um, and look at their relationships, look at their jobs, look at their lives. And it has been, uh, I guess, monumentous in one way where people have been able to get in touch with that part of them and make some large decisions in life and changes in life that yeah. are, I guess, more aligned for who they are. But then also uh, because of the trauma that was associated with it as well and the isolation that was associated with us, we still are seeing, even in my clinics and um, especially here in Melbourne still, a lot of outcomes and effects that have occurred from just being, um, you know, separated from from, from life. And, and, and we're still working through a lot of the mental health issues that have occurred in terms of the long effects of that now. Absolutely. Hence, uh, as I started with that, saying a lot of people are looking for answers now and looking for things to, to clear. And you mentioned, going back to that little horse analogy about uh, the kid that broke the, broke the leg, Bruce Lee was the same. If he didn't get kind of that spinal injury where he was like paralyzed, he oh, wouldn't yeah. have wrote the books. He wouldn't have dictated the books to his wife to write. He would have just kept on doing his stuff because he had mm-hmm. nothing to do. He was immobilized and was like the universe saying, you need to be yin. You need to be just still. And not move because we need to have all this knowledge come out now to put it on paper and to release it. And that was like a huge turning point in his career. That mm-hmm. accident, which may be branded as the worst thing in life, but for him it was the best yeah. thing that happened to him, right? Exactly. So, you know, it, Joe Dispenza was the same. You know, he had a spinal cord injury and had to learn to heal himself through through his work. So he developed his whole um work initially based upon his own experiences in life and personal experiences. And a lot of our you know, gifts come from our turbulent times. And that's not to say that you can only learn from these, but our biggest learnings usually are from the greatest teachers and the greatest teachers usually are the things that have created the most, I guess, pain or suffering and the interception for us to then transform that into something far more uh, of benefit, far more. What can, I always ask myself, how can this situation make me a more loving person than who I was before this situation? How can this situation make my life and the way I live it be even more optimal than who I was and what I was doing prior? There is something to learn from everything. And, and you know, make some lemonade from lemons because you're going to get a shitload of them here, I can promise you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I'll make I'm, I'm more of a lemon lemon meringue pie. I reckon. Oh, even better, you know. Um, so it, it is a lot is perception as well, and the belief that you attach to things that occur. If you believe that things are happening to you um, and not for your greater good, then you're going to have a painful life as well. And so it, your perception and your beliefs that you attach to the experiences are almost far more important than the experience itself. And you can see that you and I could share the exact same experience, and the way you perceive it, the way that you understand it, the way you emotionally respond to it, mm. it's going to be different to me. And it's the exact same. Experience experience but not the same for us as individuals so that's when you have to start working with the individual makeup the individual fingerprint the individual mapping and that's why spinal energetics is so cool as well because we work with that part of you um and and that that's the part that can't be reproduced in anyone else you know there'll never be another another you on this planet no one will ever have your dna no one will ever have your fingerprint no one will ever be you as you are forever and ever so that's the part we need to work with, and that's the part that we touch with this work. You heard the lady. Go and check her out, Dr. Sarah. She's a fountain of knowledge. She's a jukebox of wisdom. She's uh, all of the above. She's a complete package. She's a fashionista. She's uh, She does it all. And go and change your life and find out who you really are with some yeah, spinal exactly. energetics coming soon oh, to a theatre near okay. you. <laughs> I hope so. Thanks, Nick.